Hi. Uh, my name is Nick Cohen Meyer. I'm an attorney in California. One of my practice areas is landlord tenant. And tonight, the presentation will be on California's mobile home residency law. We will have a brief moment at the end of the presentation to answer questions. We have to be mindful that we cannot answer specific legal questions to your specific case. Uh, there are several reasons for this, but one of them is tonight's presentation will be recorded. Uh, you will have a chance to review it for the next uh, several months. And if the laws change after I've given you legal advice, um, I could be held liable. So this is general principles. This is kind of the macro, not so much of the micro. Uh, the MRL can get complicated, and I will show you how to get help. I will show you how to locate the MRL. And before I refer to the MRL, I just want everybody to understand what the name is. So up here, we have the Mobile Home Protection Law. We have the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Act. And we also have the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Program. So the MRL is a mobile home residency law. And we're going to begin now. So what we have here is the QR code. Now the QR code allows you to use your phone to scan that. I will put this up on the screen again later, so don't worry about it right now. But if you'd like to review this presentation, use your phone and it will allow you to replay the presentation online at a later date. So let's start with the MRLPA, and then we'll discuss the MRL, and then the MRLPP. So in 2018, Governor Brown signed a bill that was called AB 3066, which was also known as the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Act, the MRLPA. This was scheduled to last for five years, and the goal of the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Act was to balance the rights of mobile home owners and mobile home park owners. Now the MRL, which we'll be talking about mostly today, is the mobile home residency law, which governs the landlord-tenant relationship between mobile home parks and mobile home owners. It's been likened to the landlord-tenant law for mobile home parks. And then we have the MRLPP. The MRLPP is the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Program, which provides a channel for homeowners of mobile homes or manufactured homes to submit a complaint for violations of the MRL. So under the MRLPP, the California Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, is charged with the authority to investigate resident complaints, enforce rights, under the mobile home residency law. So a lot of acronyms, and this will be your legend. And if you, you know, aren't getting everything during today's presentation, that's expected, it's fine. You'll have a chance to download this presentation later. So. This is an index of slides. This is basically what we're going to talk about today, if we have time. Probably won't talk about everything, but just to give you an advance heads up on some of the topics, we have MRL versus Title 25. That's important because the MRL primarily applies to those of you who own the mobile home and live in the mobile home in the park. So does anybody here rent a mobile home that's at the park? Anybody rent one versus, so everybody here owns the mobile home that's at the park. Okay, good. So then, oh, it's too, too fast? Okay, all right, thank you for telling me. Okay, I'll try to slow it down. Uh, and then also just a reminder, as a courtesy, please make sure your phones are on silent. Uh, okay, so I will try to speak more slowly. I'll probably need another reminder. The MRL is basically what gives you, as a resident homeowner, rights to balance out the power that your mobile home park has. Now, they will often have the upper hand in California with uh, mobile home residency laws. It's, it's written to balance both interests, but it does lean heavily in favor of the mobile home park. So the additional slides, if there's time, will be, OK, so the MRL consists of these main sections. And the reason you want to know these things is when you have an issue, you want to know where in your MRL you can go. Now, who has never heard of the MRL or never received a copy of the MRL? Okay, right, one per I'm sure there's a few people, okay, good. It's not your fault, 
it's probably your mobile home park's fault. But the MRL comes out um, not every year. It requires significant changes in order for there to be a new version. If there's a new version, you'll know uh, by you'll, you'll know on February first. And I'll talk about the obligations of your park to give you the MRL or give you the link to download it. But when you do have a new rental agreement with your park, they're supposed to give you information about the MRL. It looks like most people here received the information. Some people did not. Um, and I'll show you exactly how to get the current copy of the MRL from the California website. But when you first have a problem, if you want to start with the MRL, then these are the areas that your problem probably falls under. But you don't have to do this yourself. And I'll explain this in a moment, but the California uh, Department of Housing and Community Development has an agency that's devoted to helping you as homeowners, specifically with MRL-related complaints. And I don't want to bury you in acronyms right now, but the agency is called the MAC, the Mobile Home Assistance Center. That will be your first point to get help. And you can get help on the phone, through email, by submitting a complaint on the website, or submitting a complaint through regular mail. And I'll show you how to contact them in a little bit. So, owners versus renters. So if you own and live in the home, then the MRL governs. So, uh, all right, I gave you a warning. The phone? Okay, so let's try to keep our phones on silent. Tenants who live in the mobile home which they own are covered under the provisions of the MRL. Tenants living in the mobile home, which they rent, which doesn't apply to anybody here, are subject to eviction protections and procedures in landlord-tenant law, not the MRL. Does everybody understand that? If you are, sure, sure. So if you're a tenant living in the mobile home that you rent, which according to the survey doesn't apply to anybody here, um, but maybe somebody just didn't want to say they did or whatever, um, I'm going to let you know because this is important. If you're a tenant, then you're generally protected under regular landlord-tenant law. A lot of California civil code in that, in that area. Um, but if you live in the mobile home, which you own in the mobile home park, then you're covered under the provisions of the MRL. And I don't think I need to get into what constitutes a mobile home or what constitutes a mobile home park. I think everybody is generally from the same park, more or less, here. So I can skip over that analysis. But the MRL does not apply to owners, occupants of RVs, such as like a park trailer, a motor home, or a park model. So there's a big distinction between a mobile home and a motor home. So MRL versus Title 25. The MRL is under the California Civil Code. The Title 25 is under the California Code of Regulations. The reason this is an important distinction is that Almost anybody can bring a complaint under Title 25, which Title 25 applies to like the infrastructure, the premises of the park. So as homeowner residents, you can bring a complaint against your mobile home park if the facilities are not working, uh, you know, the physical infrastructure. But the MRL gives you protections on top of that. As resident homeowners, you have a lot of protections. That's why you want to become familiar with the MRL. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here, to give you a big overview of the MRL, show you how to get it, show you how to get help, not to give you the nuanced you know, legal answers to specific questions, which a specific attorney, or better yet, a free attorney that will be provided to you from the HCD, Housing and the California Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, can help you if you do have a claim that they can adjudicate. So, I can skip over the majority of this because Title 25 is basically summarized in what I said. It's the premises. All right? Now, let's talk about how to download the current MRL. That's important. So if one of you wants to try this, um, you can bring out your phone. Uh, do you know how to scan a QR code? Like you see these sometimes at restaurants? And I'll give you uh, one minute to try that while I fix my tie because I realize the bottom part is hanging down. That's embarrassing. Um, so go ahead and scan that QR code. See if it shows up. Uh, whoever gets it first uh, wins glory. No actual prize. Okay, okay got it. So it worked. Okay, just want to make sure that works for someone other than just me. 
because you guys probably need this more than I do. Uh, anybody else able to get it to work? Cool, cool. Good? Yeah, yeah, share it with your neighbor. If your neighbor's not able to do it, I don't mean your actual neighbor, I mean your neighbor tonight. Uh, so this is not the only way to get a copy of the MRL. This is just a way to get you right to it to skip over a bunch of steps. So, okay? Good. Jose, did you try it? Got it. Works? Okay, cool. Nice, nice. Okay, great. And now my tie is better. Staff is, uh, yeah. Last name is Cassie. I'm assuming you can speak Spanish, but you never know. Okay. I, I hope they have some bilingual services. They do. They absolutely do. Yeah, you can get a, you can absolutely get a, um, a copy um, of everything. Okay. Is there, is there a recording? Okay. All right. All right. So let me just make sure. Is, uh, it says recording. Okay. Good. Yeah. This is uh, information that I don't want to have to redo if it's not recording. So good. All right. So we're going to move on from here. Uh, what you see, if that QR code worked, is the mobile home residency law site, which gives you the current version. You can see this goes back to 1987. You're not going to need those, but you will need the version that is current. So controls on rent increases. One of the most common questions that I think is asked is, do we have protection over the arbitrary increase of our rent? So the most concise direct answer is, under the MRL, you don't have specific protections over a rental increase. But it's more nuanced than that. Unfortunately, everything with the law is never really yes or no, black and white. It's always just, well, it depends. So it depends. Um, in short, there isn't a specific protection for the tenant over rental increases. You may have heard that there was a bill that was passed that limited rental increase for mobile homeowners. That applies to a very narrow subset of mobile homes in California. There's Right now, there's one that definitely qualifies. There's possibly four more. Uh, Rancho La Paz is not where you live, so you probably aren't protected under that. Um, that only applies if the mobile home park is controlled by two or more um, incorporated cities. So if you live in a mobile home park that is just within one city, then you don't have the protection under AB 978, which we'll talk about later. But in general, the MRL does not limit how much a mobile home park can increase the rent. But there might be temporary anti-price gouging statutes or local ordinances that could be in effect to limit the increases. So long-term mobile home leases in California were formally exempt from rent controls. So does everybody know what I mean when you say exempt from rent control? It's kind of like a double negative. Um, if there's rent controls, that says your rent cannot be increased by a certain amount. Um, and leases signed prior to February 13th, 2020 will continue to be exempt from rent, local rent stabilization ordinances until the lease expires or January 1st, 2025, whichever comes first. So again, being exempt from rent control means that you, the tenant, are not protected from rent control ordinances. However, any new leases signed after February 13th, 2020 are no longer exempt from local rent stabilization. So this means that if you have local rent stabilization ordinances, in other words, if you have local rent control in your city, and I'm not going to dispositively answer whether you do in national city or not without looking at the latest ordinance because these change, well, over the last two years with COVID, they've changed tremendously and frequently. But this is what you can start the conversation with, with the HCD, the Housing Community Development, with one of their legal counsels and see if there are any new or continuing rent control ordinances in the city for which your mobile home park exists in. So, any unilateral rental increases must be preceded by minimum 90 days notice. So unfortunately, your mobile home park can increase your rent almost as often as they want. Once, you know, once 90 days has passed, they can do it again. And then after 90 days, they can do it again. And it's terrible. And it's unfair. Um, and there's really no protection against that. But one thing that did make a difference is this assembly bill that was passed in regards to... Um, this mobile home park called Rancho La Paz. 
And those homeowners there are predominantly, you know, so they're predominantly seniors, and the rent kept increasing to the point where these seniors were going to get priced out. They couldn't afford these continued increases. They got together, they worked with the California State Assembly, and they passed a bill that basically applied the protections of the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, AB 1482, to mobile home residency tenancies. And that is something that if there's enough of you, not just within you know, National City, but statewide, if you talk to other mobile home owners, that could be an avenue for change. It's gonna be a lot of work, but the alternative to that is your mobile home park, you just keep increasing your rent and you're gonna get priced out. Now, National City, where I assume most of you live, uh, they could pass an ordinance if they haven't already. And that is another avenue for potential relief. So, controls on the frequency of rent increase. Like I said, your mobile home park can increase the rent as often as they want, as long as it's with 90 days of notice. So if they've increased your rent um, more, you know, more often than that, then that's where you have a legitimate complaint that you'd want to go to the mobile home assistance center with. And they can't increase it more than once every 90 days, but even then, like once every 90 days, once every three months, that's a lot, right? Yeah, that's ridiculous. Um, the mobile home residency law, MRL, requires a mobile home park to give residents a 90-day advance written notice prior to a rental increase. And the rental increase cannot begin until after 90 days has passed since the affected parties receive the notice of increase as delivered in person or by U.S. mail. Okay, so does AB 1482 apply to mobile home parks? Now, AB 1482, just so everybody knows, this was passed in 2019. This is basically a suite of protections for tenants in California that predominantly live in multifamily housing, like apartments, et cetera. Um, if you live in an apartment, it's usually covered by AB 1482. Not always, there are exceptions, but usually. Um, doesn't apply here except for the fact that, as you're gonna see in a moment, the tenants who got together at Rachel La Paz uh, got the protections of AB 1482 largely to apply to them. And when you do that, when you get protections under AB 1482, you get protections from eviction, it has to be uh, at fault just cause, and um, no fault just cause, there's different, protections that you get, there's different recourse that you get from your landlord depending on the type of eviction, and best of that, there's a cap on rental increase. It's very strict on how much the landlord can increase rent and how often, and it's a lot more favorable to the tenant. So AB 1482, just so you know that um, it doesn't apply to you now, but if you can do what the tenants at Rental La Paz did, it might. So, AB 978 is what I referred to several times in the past few minutes. This does not apply to you, but it does apply to one or potentially five mobile home parks in California that fit the narrow criteria, meaning governed by two or more incorporated cities. So, it, it applies um, not here. It passed in June of... Well, actually, as of June of 2022, there's still only one mobile home park in California that is located within and governed by two or more incorporated cities. Uh, now, there potentially might be four more, but um, it's worth learning about this to see if you have a possibility of doing what these residents did to get more protections in National City. And AB 978 has an expiration date of January 1st, 2030. Uh, it prohibits the management of a mobile home park from increasing the gross rental rate more than 3% plus CPI up to a combined maximum ceiling of 5%. So wouldn't that be great if your rent could be capped at 5%, the rent increase could be capped at 5%? That's why this is a battle that's potentially worth waging. And that's based on the lowest gross rental rate charged to the tenant at any time during the immediately preceding rolling 12 months. So it gives you some stability, it gives you some predictability as to what your rent is going to be in the near and one year out future from now. Yeah. Question. Do any of these laws uh, preempt any potential local laws that no. could be passed? Oh, no. Good, good question. For flexibility for local municipalities to... No, oh, excellent question. That? So the question was, do these laws preempt any local laws? Uh, would it allow flexibility? And the answer to this is, 
if there's a local law that gives the tenant more protection than the statewide law, in other words, MRL gives you some protections, but if National City were to pass a specific ordinance that limited rental increases, the local one would prevail. So the local one would preempt the state law if it gives more protections to the tenant. So can a mobile home park charge separate maintenance or pass through fees in addition to the rent? Yes, if the fees are already mentioned in the lease, then a mobile home park can charge and increase the fees without a new notice. A fee for late payment of rent or utilities can be charged if stipulated in the lease or rental agreement. Now, there may be a local ordinance that regulates fees or pass-through costs from management to residents. And just as we just spoke, if there's a local ordinance, that supersedes state one. If these are new fees that are not already mentioned in the lease, the mobile home park can add those. And, and 60-day notice, written notice, will be required prior to the new fees for new services going into effect. Okay, so a lot of power is given to the mobile home park. Um, just because the fees are not mentioned in the lease doesn't mean they can't add them. They can. They just have to give you 60 days notice. That's because all the protection you get. All right, so MRLPP. What is the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Program? M, M, mobile Home Residency Law Protection Program. Um, it's when, when California created the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Act of 2018, our state also created the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Program. And the, M, the, the Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Program began January 1st, 2020, scheduled to end on January 24th, 2024, unless extended. And it provides more than just another annual fee that you all have to, have to pay. So some of you have to pay a $10 annual fee. Anybody know about that? $10 annual fee? Yes? Um, so the $10 annual fee is usually charged to the homeowner, and that provides homeowners channels for recourse with dealing with disputes with park management that concern violations of the mobile home residency law. Now, one of these channels is a program that allows mobile home owners to submit a complaint, so long as the complaint comes from a mobile home homeowner and a mobile home homeowner who is residing in a permitted mobile home park, and it concerns the provisions of the MRL. So it's those three criteria. Now, the Mobile Home Assistance Center, and this is a screenshot from their website, uh, it provides help if you have any of these questions or concerns. For example, health or safety risks in your mobile home park, like unsafe sewer, water, electrical, ga gas connections. Um, do you need help with the installation, inspection, maintenance, or alteration of manufactured homes, accessory structures? Do you suspect lawful or unlicensed mobile home sales practices by dealers or salespersons? Do you need information on the mobile home residency law and where to obtain assistance for lease or rent disputes within park management? Do you need assistance with your mobile home ownership documents? Are you seeking compensation for fraudulent motor home, mobile home sale? Do you need information on local resources available to you? And if you've answered yes to any of the above, then they can help, okay? So I'll, I'll stand back so if some of you wanna take a picture of this. And those are the numbers, the email address, the website, and the mailing address for the Mobile Home Assistance Center. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, this is where you want to start. When you have problems, you don't need to go out and pay a lawyer to analyze your problem under the MRL. You start here, and they will help you usually for free, almost always for free. Okay. And I put another QR code. I think we all know how to use QR codes now. Here's the website, but if you want to scan that QR code, it'll take you right to the Mac, the Mobile Home Assistance Center. So that's the website. That's the QR code. And there's also an MHRF. So this is the Manufactured Home Recovery Fund. Now, this is going to be one of your last resorts. And I won't spend too much time on it, just other than it's available to reimburse actual and direct losses up to $75,000 for any person who has sold or purchased a manufactured home or mobile home for personal or family residential use or rest purposes, so not business purposes, and who suffered a loss due to the manufacturer's failure to honor warranties or guarantees, fraud or willful misrepresentation, fraud, 
uh, of basically any of these six reasons. Uh, so when you basically run the gamut, you can't get help from the manufacturer of your home, there's another recourse in California. So California, it's a good place to be a tenant normally. It's a good place to be an employee compared to other states. Um, it's a pretty good place to be a mobile home resident, even though it seems like you guys are getting gouged. Uh, California has a lot of protections for what they say the little guy. And you know, they want to balance the power of resources. You know, the companies, the landlords, multifamily especially, they tend to have more financial resources. They can drain their opposition. California fights back on behalf of the tenant, the homeowner, the employee. So you are not taking advantage of the amount of taxes you pay to live here. The amount of taxes you pay gives you a lot of services that you don't get in other states. So when it feels like it's hopeless, when it feels like you're getting just gouged, make sure you're taking advantage of these services that you're directly or indirectly paying for. Just like that $10 annual fee I talked about. That gives you access to the MRLPP. So, how to submit a complaint. So, I recorded my screen here just showing uh, you, you can submit a complaint to the Mobile Assistance Center. They process complaints from the public regarding mobile manufactured homes, not RVs, right? Mobile homes, mm -hmm. not motor homes, as well as the health and safety violations within privately owned and operated employee housing. So the staff of the MAC, the Mobile Home Assistance Center, provides information, coordination, referrals, and other systems to help in the resolution of these complaints. And examples of complaints might be regarding the accumulation of garbage, debris, sewage spills, and proper additions or alterations to units, and as previously mentioned, unlawful evictions. So what's the problem with getting evicted as a mobile homeowner versus just a tenant? It's... Uh, yeah, usually I ask questions, but I'll just leave it rhetorical for now. The problem with getting evicted as a mobile homeowner is what do you do with your home? Like, these are called mobile homes, but they're generally not like a motor home. You don't just, you know, pick up the chocks and drive away. It's very extensive to move a mobile home, especially if it's been there for a decade, two decades. You have landscaping. It's not just ready to move. Mobile homes generally imply that it's mobile from the factory to its semi-permanent resting place. But after that, you're really in a tough spot if you have to move it. So this is why it's important to fight an eviction as a tenant. It's especially important to fight an eviction as a mobile home, homeowner and resident. So if you don't have internet access, you can call the mobile home assistance center. They'll email, they will mail you a phone. And here's more information. This might be a little easier for you to take a picture of. I'll stand out of the way for a second. Let me test this. So I'm going to move on because this information is available for you to review after. Who enforces the MRL? No, no not me. Um, this is. I'm a. Judge pro tem for small things court, uh, so temp judge, that's why I'm there. Uh, so, generally, civil courts via attorneys or self help, occasionally prosecutors if it's a real bad violation. Uh, and then the Motor Home, Mobile Home Residency Law Protection Act via the California Department of Housing and Community Development. That's the MRLBA via HCD. And I'm throwing a lot of terms at you guys. Uh, don't try to digest everything, don't try to take notes, just absorb it and then review it. So, the utility related issues, um, under the Public Utilities Code, any master meter customer, such as many parks, can only charge residents the same amount that, that, is that a question? Somebody says something. Um, only, basically, the, the park cannot profit when they're charging the utilities. So, they can, am I in your way? Okay, all right. Is that better? Okay. Now am I blocking you? Okay. All right, so master meter customers, and this is generally like mobile home parks, can only charge residents the same amount that the local utility would charge the resident. And then any utility rebates or incentives for low income residents must be passed through. So there are certain programs in California for low income residents for utilities. Obviously, your mobile home park cannot 
charge you the full amount if you qualify for a lower rate. They have to extend that discount to you. Um, any of you think that your mobile park is not giving you the low income rates that you're qualified for, don't contact me. Contact the Mobile Home Assistance Center. That is probably a violation. And I don't say probably, I shouldn't say probably, it needs to be investigated, but if it's as you suspect, they will get to the bottom of it. But here's a tip. When you contact the Mobile Home Assistance Center, have your records in front of you. Have your utility bills. Have the proof that you qualified for one of the California care programs that you are supposed to get low income. Have everything ready and organized so you can get help. It helps you get help. You want to be able to preempt, you know, answer the questions that they're likely going to ask you uh, rather than just say, I, I, don't, I don't know. These people are really busy at the mobile home assistance center. Uh, when you finally get them on the phone, you don't want to waste their time and your time. So if you feel that you're being overcharged in a park with metered water served by regulated gas, you know, you know, anyways, meters that are regulated and you feel like you're getting overcharged, then check with the manager, write them a letter first, and if you can't get anywhere with the manager, uh, you can call the county or file a complaint with the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Code. But again, the easiest thing for you, if I have to give you just like one tip, if you have a problem, start with the Mobile Home Assistance Center. They know how to reach the California Public Utilities. Uh, they know how to talk to the county. They even know how to talk to the DA if this is a criminal matter. So, the resident, well, I'm talking about utilities a little bit more. This is a kind of a joke image. Uh, they can pass restrictions on like how big your satellite dish can be. This would be a little excessive. Like you don't need to communicate with Mars. You just need to get like Sports Center. So, can the park start billing residents for utilities that were previously included in the rent? So, do we understand what that means? Can they start billing you for something that previously they weren't billing you for in terms of utilities? And can the park manager reduce or eliminate park services and amenities that the residents have already been paying for? Well, if the residents' rental agreement provides that sewer, water, and garbage are included in the rent then the park management may elect to itemize or charge separately for these utilities. Now in this case, the average monthly amount of the utility charges will be deducted from the rent. If the lease or rental agreement stipulates separate charges, then the resident must pay. And if the rental agreement does not specifically indicate that utility charges are included in the rent, then the park owner could charge for them after giving a written 60-day notice. Now cable TV is not considered an essential utility, so the park cannot charge the resident for a fee for a service they do not use. In other words, if you're not using cable TV and you're getting charged for it, you can complain to the park management. They shouldn't be charging you for that if you can prove that you don't use it, such as you don't have the ability to access it. That would be pretty obvious rather than you have the hookup but you just tell them, I don't watch it. That's hard to prove. So if stipulated in the signed lease rental agreement, however, the resident must pay the fee for cable TV. If not, Stipulated, in other words, if not included in the lease. When I say stipulated, I just basically mean like contractually agreed for. Uh, so if not stipulated in the lease rental agreement, then the park must provide a 60 day advance written notice of a fee for services actually rendered. So satellite dishes are allowable on your property, and that's under federal law, the Telecommunication, Telecommunications Act of 1996. Uh, now, as long as the dish is not more than 39 inches in diameter, does not constitute a health and safety problem, you're allowed to have a satellite dish. They cannot deny you that. But park rules can regulate how you place the satellite dish, the design of the antenna, uh, other things, you know, to an extent that's reasonable. So if the service or amenities are not guaranteed in a signed rental agreement, the manager can eliminate the park services. But if the services and amenities are part of a signed lease rental agreement, they still may be eliminated as long as they give you an equal proportional reduction in rent. Now, to be clear, you cannot get uh, rental protections from the MRL. They're, it doesn't cap rent on its own. But if you are getting charged for services that you're not getting, such as uh, cleanup, like garbage, um, you know, a park that they maybe gave you an assessment for, or you're paying extra, but the thing that you're being charged for is not actually happening, 
That's where you can complain from the MRL. That's where you are getting charged for services that you're not getting, and you do have rights under that. So that would be kind of a backdoor way to negotiate the lease and say, either you provide these services or you deduct the amount that I'm paying for these services from my rent. So is a park manager allowed to enter the resident's lot without notice? So the park manager may enter private lots under reasonable circumstances, but the park manager cannot enter the home or enclosed accessory structures without prior written consent of the homeowner. Is a park manager responsible for distributing a copy of the MRL to every resident annually? This is what we talked about earlier. So the bill AB 2120 signed in 2010, that eliminated the automatic delivery of the mobile home residency law to park residents in California. So California, you know, a lot of great things, but they're very environmentally conscious, and I think they didn't want uh, hundreds of thousands of pages printed every year for people that weren't really reading it. And that was in 2010, so 12 or so years later, uh, we have a lot better internet access. You can access it through a phone now. That probably wasn't so easy back then. Uh, now there's even less reason for the park owners to have to distribute the MRL every time. So it's just because it wasn't given to you in the past few years doesn't mean they're in violation of that. All right. Now, prior to February 1st of each year, if a significant change was made to the MRL, then the park owner manager should provide all owners with a copy of the MRL or provide written notice to all homeowners that there has been a change in the MRL and that homeowners may obtain a copy of the MRL from the management at no charge. Right? So does everybody understand that? That if there's been a change, then by February 1st, you'll be notified that you can either get a copy or where to get a copy. And it won't be any charge to you. So the park rental agreement and the park rules and regulations must be consistent with the MRL and other laws that apply in parks. So back to Jose's question, if the park... Oh no, I stand by. Uh, Okay. Let me take a drink. But... All right, is everybody finding this helpful? You good. It's a lot of information. I know it feels like a college class, probably, but uh, hopefully you have more interest in this than I ever had in any of my college classes. So uh, this is information that could save you from getting evicted. It could save you potentially thousands of dollars. Uh, it's it's hard to make this you know exciting, but it is important. Now I got my other camera going. Okay, GoPro, start recording. Oh man, it's getting too hot for the camera. So, the key provisions of the MRL apply only to homeowners. However, the universal park rules, such as for the premises, those apply to everybody. And the reason I'm saying this is some of you might have caretakers. Some of you might be caretakers. If you're a caretaker, you don't have the same rights as the homeowner resident, but you do have the right to have a safe premises, and that's where 
Title 25 would come in and protect you for that. Um, anybody can really bring a complaint from Title 25, but not everybody can bring a complaint under the MRL. All right, so when can a park deny tenancy to a prospective mobile home purchaser? So there's only four conditions where if you are trying to get a tenancy in a new mobile home park or maybe one of your friends or family members wants to move in to the mobile home park you're living, uh, they can only deny for one of those four reasons. I think those are, uh, as long as the interpreter is translating those, they should be simple enough uh, without me having to go into detail. I think they're straightforward. Okay, good. And the park managers on premises, so uh, this is a video I took of a mobile home park in North County, but uh, for mobile home parks with 50 or more lots, I'll just skip right to this. Do, do you all have a manager on premises? Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. No? Okay, so it depends on how large your mobile home park is. If there's 50 or more lots, the park manager is normally required to live on the premises. And again, this is the law, so it's not always an absolute yes or an absolute no. They generally are required. But the park manager does not have to actually be on the premises 24 hours a day. They're, that's a health and safety code that says they can you know, leave for reasonable reasons. If the park has fewer than 50 lots, then it doesn't require a manager to live on the premises. But either way, the park manager does have to be available by phone or other communication device to respond to health and safety emergencies affecting the park. So how can the residents find out who owns and operates the park? This was one of the questions we were asked. The manager shall provide the name and address of the park owner to residents who request it. And listings of park owners and operators can be found in the State Department of Housing, the HCD Mobile Home and RV Parks website at www.hcd.ca.gov. Uh, I'll give you a moment to write that down if you want, because I know at least one person had that question, if not so. Now, I don't want to ask you know, who is asking that question for your own privacy, but um, if they're trying to be evasive, in other words, they're, they're not answering your question as to you know, who the mobile home park owner is, contact, let's see, pop quiz, who would you contact first? What's the agency you would contact first? Oh man, <laughs> I've done a terrible job. <laughs> So the Mobile Home Assistance Center, the, the MAC, all right? Think of like big MAC uh, is gonna help you. <laughs> yeah. um, so the Mobile Home, yeah, we tell us. So the Mobile Home Assistance Center is going to be your first step. Um, you know, your very first step will be to get your documents in order, any records of communication you've had. Um, you know, one of the most generic tips as a lawyer is to advise clients to write things down. Keep it in writing. Written communication solves a lot of problems that oral communication creates. And fortunately we live in a time now where text message I'm sure that guy was ignored as a child. So um, <clears throat> we live in an age where Written communication is far easier than it would have been years ago before text messages. So text messages are normally admissible in court. Uh, depends on you know the the standard, but email is great. Email is practical. Written correspondence is not so practical. So when you're dealing with your mobile home park management, to the extent you can, send an email, send a text. If you have only a verbal conversation, maybe just out in the park or in the office. You can send a follow-up email, just corroborating, confirming what was said. If they don't respond or they call you back each time, they don't have anything writing, that's a red flag. So be mindful of these, these games that landlords and mobile home park owners might play. And so is the new park management allowed to change the rules on long-term residents, or are the residents grandfathered in under the old rules? When I say grandfathered in, meaning are you entitled to the same rules as before because you were there first? And the answer is a 
existing residents are not exempt from park rule changes. A six-month advance written notice is required for a rule change. A 60-day advance notice is required if a rule change affects the common recreational facilities, right? So six months for rule changes that are like substantive in nature, 60 days if it's just affecting the common recreational facilities. All right, so that is the conclusion of the main part of my presentation. Uh, we talked about the MRL, we talked about Title 35, we talked about your rights as a tenant for getting a copy of the MRL, we talked about what you can do if you have a complaint, and if you have a complaint, who do you contact first? Yeah. Yes, yes. All right, we learned one thing at least. Okay, good. So, uh, my name is Nick Holmeyer. Thank you for your time. I hope you found this helpful, and that's the end of the main presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.